Good evening and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for another hour of answering your gardening questions. If you have a question you'd like to submit to the show, call us at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll free number is 1-800-676-5446. We'd also be happy to hear from you via email. You can send those pictures to byf at unl.edu. Tell us as much information as you can, including where you live, and make sure those pictures are JPEG if possible. Be sure to also check out all of our social media options, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So let's get our show started with a few samples from somebody losing his voice. voice yes. So let's see if you can do this <laughs> without talking. Let's see if talking. I can get through this. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk a little about forensic um, dentology with rodents. So people see things that they... What, did that? What caused that damage to that tree or whatever? Well, you have to remember that this is a skull of a rat, and it, it with the top teeth it anchors, and with the bottom teeth it causes the marks. So if you know what the bottom teeth look like, then you could decide that a rat did that. And here we have some <laughs> seeds that were brought into someone's, I think, um, bin, mm -hmm. but this was done by a deer mouse. You can tell by the teeth. Here we have some irrigation pipe, 13 line ground squirrel by the teeth. Here we have a piece of shrub, deer by the teeth, not rabbit. This is rabbit because rabbits right there have peg incisors and leave extra marks. So we know that is the rabbit. And lastly, our friend the beaver with the big teeth marks. <laughs> So, leave it to you. Leave to it to the beaver, yep. <laughs> oh, brother, it's just leave it to beaver. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right, Bill. All right, so tonight I have um, some grass here. So I've been getting a lot of calls and emails, and the show's been getting emails too, about what is this grass in my grass? And it's, it's grass. Uh, <laughs> this is a sample from my backyard, um, and it's... They, this grass was mowed at the exact same time 10 days ago. Same soil, same water, but half of my yard is growing like crazy. We've got about six, eight inch grass here. The other half is barely growing at all. So what is going on here? This is a situation where we have the turf type tall fescue breaking dormancy a little bit sooner than the bluegrass. So we're seeing this tall fescue in this spring growth surge and it's growing like crazy. The bluegrass needs a little bit more fertilizer and I haven't fertilized my yard as much and so it is slower to, to, uh, to green up because there's not that fertilizer there. So the tall fescue greens up quicker, but it uses less fertilizer and so it can handle my poorly fertile backyard and so it's growing like crazy, whereas the bluegrass is not. Uh, if I put some fertilizer on it, the bluegrass will start to get going and then everything will even back out. In the middle of summer, you can't tell one from the other. Um, an important thing though, if you're trying to manage for the tall fescue like I am, if I over fertilize, I'm actually gonna encourage the bluegrass to win, it's competition. So the bluegrass will outcompete the tall fescue. So I'm trying to balance not too much fertilizer to give this guy the advantage over this guy because I want that tall fescue in my yard. Um, another thing to note too is uh, my, yard, my mower is very dull. And you can see that <laughs> by all the little marks on the tips of the leaves. And so if you're setting your mower up, like this weekend I'm gonna go out and I'm going to set my mower and sharpen it up so I don't see any of this fraying uh, on the leaves. Um, another thing too, this is exactly why I say don't fertilize in early spring, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm already having a hard time keeping up with mowing. It's wet now, and so the grass is bolting out of the ground. When it starts to slow down in May, that's when I like to go with the fertilizer. So I let the surge kind of happen, and then I fertilize after that surge. Perfect. It's always nice to know that the person who's the expert is like not sharpening the mower blades. <laughs> All right, Kyle. Yeah. He's busy. I just He's had busy. to give that one to you. I'll take it. All right, All Kyle, right. what do you have? Well, um, fortunately, we still don't have a whole lot of diseases that are, we don't have, we don't have a whole lot of things coming up out of the ground yet. And so a lot of tree diseases are still what we're talking about. Um, here we have Dothostroma needle blight uh, on pines. And these samples were collected on campus, but one of the distinguishing features of Dothostroma will be um, towards the tip of the needle, it's still green, and then there may be a red band or two in the middle, which we can kind of see right there. 
but then it'll green back up as we go further up the uh, further up the needle. But then they all have these brown tips where they're starting to die. The other thing that we can see for Dothostroman needle blight is here on the um, on the cone. But there are all these black little specks. They're almost uh, pimples, but those are the fruiting bodies where the uh, where the fungus is able able to overwinter. And so, if you if you are noticing that your spruce tree is just uh, not not greening up as well as it should, and, and you're seeing a lot of these maybe red bands or some uh, some of these black specks on your on your pine cones, it's a good chance that you are dealing with Dothostroma needle blight. Um, this disease is pretty easily controlled. Um, through the use of just some copper, some copper products, Bordeaux's mixture works very well. So two applications of Bordeaux's mixture, um, one in about a week, week and a half, when the needles are, are about half expanded, and then you want to come back and do a repeat application in three to four weeks, so probably mid June, um, for that second application to um, to protect the newer needles for Dothostroma. Perfect, Kyle. Except that spruces don't have pine cones. Pine tree, not a spruce tree. I'm, and once again, Kim is making fun of my inability to ID plants. <laughs> uh, no, I'm you just giving that. you a gentle little <laughs> hint. Yes. Calling me out. All right, what do you have, Jeff, for your well, sample? Well, I'm not um, going to threaten any uh, floral designers out there, so I don't want anyone <laughs> to think that I was trying to put anything together other than trying to find some things that were flowering. I think we're all noticing that things are a little slower. And I even noticed that um, for like these Berkwood viburnums here, mm -hmm. they're not as, uh, there's not as many flowers on there as we normally would see. So, um, but anyway, so we have the, the viburnums, the early viburnums are starting to do their thing. And uh, so they smell nice. Um, I have the yellow, the Caria japonica, which is kind of the only yellow thing I could find right now on a, on a woody plant, so which is kind of fun. And then, uh, just because I won't be on for a few weeks, and I don't normally catch pawpaw, uh, they were just today starting to push a little bit, and it's a very unusual flower. It's upside down, and they're just starting to, to um, extend right now. So, kind of a fun little thing, something we normally don't see, so. Mm -hmm. And I see a crab apple in there too, don't I? Uh, there's a, uh, something a cherry, there. cherry in here. Yep. Yeah, kind of snuck in there, mixed in <laughs> with the viburnum. So, again, like I said, uh, my wife will get this lovely bouquet after the show. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll prune it the way yeah, she right. wants it. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. All right, guys, let's start with pictures. This is really fun, Dennis. Okay. Um, this is actually a Lincoln viewer who has seen a fox family in their neighborhood and a mother with four pups. And she's, she has a, what looks like a tracking collar and he's wondering if this is intentional to, to record her commute. Well, we're uh, at the University of Nebraska the Department of Wildlife. We have two master students working on fox in Lancaster County and we're putting collars on as many as we can. One of the things we're looking at to see if they're carrying diseases, and it seems like, well, we don't have the data in yet, but the chances of getting diseases from fox are really, really, really low. Rabies and everything else is really low with fox. They don't go after your dogs. They don't go after your children. Um, they, they'll go after baby rabbits and rodents. Um, so just embrace them. Don't worry about them. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do see them, you can go to our project on iNaturalist which is iNaturalist Lincoln Fox Project, or there's a Facebook one where you can put in when you see them, especially if you see one with a radio collar, and it would be at, face, at um, Lincoln Fox Project from Facebook. Yeah, pretty cool. They're just yeah. such beautiful animals. Yeah, and we've been testing them, and we're not, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. They may get some fleas from cats, but they're not giving anybody else fleas. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm going to dig up my uh, research plots, though. So. <laughs> All right. That's turf. Yeah. <laughs> All right, turf. It's your turn for a question. Okay. So this is one actually Matt answered essentially the same way I think you're going to answer it last week, but we didn't show the pictures. And this okay. is the battle between zoysia and RTF. Okay. Uh, and this particular homeowner would, would prefer that the fescue win. Okay. So how do we do this? You know, the, the one, one way of doing it with products you can easily get, it's going to be non-selective control uh, roundup once that uh, zoysia grass starts to break dormancy. When it's breaking dormancy, it's going to have very low sugar levels, and so it's going to rely on whatever has left to start to regrow. 
Um, and so trying to uh, manage to, uh, to kill that with multiple applications of Roundup and going into the tall fescue, and don't just go right where that border is, that's one thing you can do. There are selective options, uh, that tenacity mesotrione herbicide, uh, or Pylex is another herbicide that are more specialty products. Um, if you can't find them, you could always reach out to a lawn care company who might have those products uh, and try to kill. But again, those are going to be sequential applications of those too. You can't just make one application. Um, and then you'll come in and, and seed uh, those areas. Um, but the problem is going to be you're going to be seeding in the summer summertime, so it's going to be a bit of an issue. So sodding might be um, a better alternative there. Um, and then when you see it, if you see it come back, just be very proactive with trying to kill anything that's growing back uh, immediately. Uh, it's just going to be a battle that you're going to fight uh, for the remainder of this year. And if the seed comes in thin, then seed again um, in, the, uh, in the fall when you have a better chance of getting better establishment. So something you're going to have to work at, but something that's not unattainable either. All right. Thanks, Bill. All right, Kyle. This is um, an Omaha viewer who has aspens. They're about six years old. And the real issue that she is concerned about with these aspens, they look pretty good, mm -hmm. but one of them has this growth looking thing at the base of the tree. Uh, she doesn't know if it's a root situation or a shoot situation or a rot or a spot or what. Yeah, so uh, that looks to me like crown rot or crown gall um, caused by a bacterial pathogen, um, agrobacterium. It's prevalent in soils just everywhere and can affect a lot of a lot of plants that are out there and and really one of the things that agrobacterium does is it causes those galls to form um, especially any place where where the tr where the plant will come into contact with the soil and so in the tree in this case right at the base of the tree that's where it's in contact with the soil now we're having a lot of this crown gall um, coming in Older trees can um, tolerate crown gall to some extent. However, I would, I would keep an eye out on that tree. Um, eventually, that bacteria will, will degrade the roots to a point where there's a good chance that it, that it could topple. Um, the other thing you'll want to look for is just watch the other trees that are in the area. If you have crown gall on one of those aspens, it's probably not too long before you'll start seeing it on the other two. All right, thanks, Kyle. <clears throat> okay, this is an Aurora viewer, Jeff. Yeah, right. Um, they have the green giant arborvita Great. on their acreage, mm -hmm. and they're all showing signs of stress, right. a la this kind of stress. Right, right. Um, this one was, <clears throat> excuse me, four years old. Others have been planted after that. Is this winter kill? Is what, what do we think with this particular evergreen? Well, unfortunately, it's just not a good choice for um, really a lot of the state of Nebraska. Um, you know, we have them, you'll see them in the, the eastern part, and, and they may do uh, fairly well if they're protected. So if you have a fairly protected site, maybe just uh, the east side of your home or something like that, uh, I have one at home, and again, it's, it's in a protected place, and it's doing pretty well. But for a windbreak, uh, this would not be my choice. You know, I, again, I know red cedar isn't real sexy, but it's, it's extremely tough and would do well in something like this. There's a variety of pines that would do well out there as well. So I think I would, uh, you know, move the arborvitae, the ones that are still alive, if you have some place around the home that's protected, they might have a chance there and then look for something a little tougher for out for a windbreak. All right, thanks, Jeff. Well, you might recall last week when Lauren showed us his poor apple tree that was full of cankers. We're going to return to his place to take a closer look at the same tree with a different problem and hear another reason why he had to rogue it out. One of the things that's really important in a landscape is making sure we're positioning all these different plants in the right place and especially with trees many times we're talking about full shade sun understory canopy trees uh, trees that are going to be shorter in stature larger trees but one of the things that's really important is to look at the susceptibility of that tree to some of our common disease problems in this particular case we put in a golden delicious apple that is very susceptible to cedar apple rust within feet of a, a row of junipers now in this case this is actually my own backyard and i designed this so I would have something I thought I could manage. And for the last 10 years, I've brought samples to Backyard Farmer on the cedar or the apple and shown pictures, but this has simply gotten kind of out of control. And even though I know when to spray, I never have enough time 
to actually get those applications on enough to keep it covered so I can really protect the tree. So this is a poor design situation. And if you're in a, a landscape or moving into one or have one where you're battling a specific disease, always important to look at what those different species are around it. If it is a rust, many times like this, we've got a disease that goes from the apple to the juniper and then back from the juniper to the apple. So right here, you can see we're in close proximity. If this was across the yard, maybe even 100 yards away, wouldn't have near as much disease pressure. This would be much easier to manage. But looking at wind directions, looking at where it is in proximity with those winds, those predominant winds that are gonna blow those spores when those teleo horns come out on those cedar apple rust galls, uh, that's the time you know, where you're gonna look at positioning. So uh, the biggest thing though, making sure we're looking at disease resistance. We always have cedar apple rust. We always have scab in Nebraska. Uh, both of those are diseases that, that are gonna be there. So making sure you pick a, a cultivar that is less susceptible or rate it with resistance is gonna be critical. If you are in a situation after you have to manage these diseases and you have a susceptible tree established, again, make sure you're looking at surrounding host if it is something that's running and, and alternating from host to host in your yard. And then finally, if you have to make uh, an application to protect that, making sure you're using fungicides at the proper time to uh, reduce the potential for infection. And again, in this case, it's, it's been almost an impossible battle and I could never treat it enough. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take this tree out and we're gonna start up again with either a resistant apple tree, we're gonna renovate the site, or maybe not even an apple at all where we're so close to the juniper row. You might remember those Taylor junipers being loaded with those cedar apple rust galls from a few years ago when we did a feature on it. And as Lauren said, having those junipers so close to his apple tree was really gonna be a problem. And I think it's about a two mile range anyway, besides which he just wanted to use that chainsaw. That's right. Pure and simple. <laughs> All right, your turn for a picture, Dennis. Okay. Um, this is Midtown Omaha. She came home one afternoon to find this creature in her front yard and then a 10 to 12 inch diameter mound of soil with no hole in the middle of the backyard. Are they related? Probably, there should be a hole. This is a woodchuck or groundhog, same animal, and he's out sunning himself, they're diurnal. Um, it's a weird tree behind there. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, they, they, they'll take stuff from the garden, and, like corn and zucchini. They love zucchini and things like that. But their holes are usually go into a bank about 20 foot. The opening is round, about 10 inches. And they do leave big mounds of dirt when they go in. Um, and she may be having pups if it's a female. I can't tell from the picture. Um, but if she may be just in the area sunning herself. But if there's a mound of dirt, there's got to be a hole someplace. And the, the, your only alternative is to live trap or in a cage trap and then uh, have it removed. And because of regulations, it has to be moved by the right people and taken care of by the right people. All right, thank you, Dennis. But pretty cool to see a right smack in the middle of the driveway yep. in the middle of the day. It looks huge relative to that car in the background. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. They don't get that big. Look over that. <laughs> All right, so Bill, uh, you have another lawn question here. Okay. This is a Ralston viewer. Fertilized, watered, and seeded, but the lawn is not responding. What? It could be a couple different things. Um, the most likely is it's a low, one of the more comp, uh, newer bluegrasses, um, and newer I mean it's in a, created in the last 20, 25 years. They are just known to be kind of dogs at getting going in the spring, and so that's most likely what it is. It's just really strong dormancy response. Usually the fertilizer and the water will help, but if we don't have the temperatures, and we, um, it's not going to get going. And so this is a, this is a chronic problem. Uh, that area is exposed at all to it during the winter time. Uh, if it's northwest facing, it's going to be even further set back. And so just be a little bit patient with it. The fertilizer should help to, to get it to grow again. But that's my uh, most likely guess. The other thing that would do that is compaction. But you need to have a lot of people to have that uniform of, of, of compaction. So um, just be a little patient. If we don't see some green up, uh, you know, adding things like compost can really help if it is a compaction, but it also help with that that spring green up too. So doing some compost top dressing can help. All right, thank you, Bill. All right, Kyle, this is a, a viewer from Cedar Bluffs. 
She has Colorado blue spruce, uh, and she's wondering what happened and can it be saved? So there is the big guy, and yeah. I think she has a picture of maybe a little closer up of okay. what happened. Well, at least on the uh, on the picture of the whole tree, it looks like a lot of the the curve. Last year's needles are still there, so the the most recent growth is still there. When it, and it thins out as you move move inside, gets some of that older growth. Um, I would guess that it's uh, a needle cast disease, so possibly rhizosphera, uh, maybe stigmina. Basically, if you would um, look at those needles that are still attached, you might start to see some of those black, just kind of pimple things erupting out of the, eru erupting from one side. If it is rhizosphera, um, you'll see those black dots kind of in just perfect lines along the needles. Um, stigmina, they're not as, not in as much of a line. As far as control, uh, similar to similar to Dothostroma, um, this is one that we're getting close to the time where we do want to treat for it. And so again, um, some of these copper uh, copper products work fairly well for Rhizosphera. With your first application <coughs> coming when the needles are about half exposed, so um, again in about a week or two, and then f a follow up application um, three to four weeks later. So we're looking at kind of a mid June follow up application to to uh, protect it as well. One thing with both of those needle cast diseases, you'll want to um, do treatment for at least two consecutive years. Um, that way, we should have good control and hopefully you won't need to treat it a, th a third year. All right, excellent, thanks Kyle. All right, <clears throat> we don't know where, excuse me, we don't know where this viewer is from, Jeff, but okay. she wants to know what this flower is. And uh, she sent a pretty nice picture and obviously oh. not blooming now, but this right. was last year, so she's wondering what this is. Um, that is, uh, it goes by a few different names, Scarlet Gila, Gilia and uh, Standing Cypress, uh, it's Ipomips, Ipomipsis, you can say it for me, a rubra, <laughs> um, but anyway, it's a biennial, uh, it's a mm -hmm. native to farther south, more like Texas and Arizona. We had this a couple years ago, didn't mm -hmm. we? I remember mm -hmm. having someone else. Um, so um, it, it will self-seed, which is kind of nice. Kinda, so treat it kind of like hollyhock. So this year you may see some rosettes of this this mm -hmm. year, and the next year you'll get some blooming again, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Good for hummingbirds, and I think Gladys had quite a bit of this at one okay. point. Yeah, so scarlet gilia. Yeah, gilia. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's time to take a peek now at our garden where Terry James shows us a river, but not the kind of river you'd expect. Let's take a minute to see what's happening out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week at the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're gonna look at what we were doing this winter again. Uh, this year, the National Garden Bureau has made 2018 the year of the tulip. We knew this was coming, so we decided that we wanted a river of tulips in our garden. So we ordered 1,500 red and white tulips. Master Gardeners put these down in late October, early November, and look at the results. We have a beautiful river running down along our rain chain, highlighting the red and white of the Huskers. We also have some stuff coming up in our perennial garden. As you can see, we have some asparagus. It's the third year for our asparagus both the purple and the green. So this year we'll be able to harvest a tiny little bit of asparagus and have some grilled asparagus with our dinners sometime this spring. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out the garden. You know, those tulips are gorgeous for a couple more days. That asparagus is up, so we are right around the corner from getting everything else planted in that garden and it's worth a visit pretty much every day. Besides which, it's almost warm enough for ice cream. There you go. <laughs> it's always warm enough. Yeah. All right, so a follow-up to our fox okay. picture. This is a Fremont viewer who is wondering whether foxes will attack cats. Okay, they will chase them off if they have young kids. Um, and they, if it's a small cat and it's, it seems to be coming towards them, they will fight back, and if they come to, because cats will kill their young, especially mm. bobcats, so they won't utilize cats primarily as a food source unless there's nothing else, but they will fight back um, or keep cats away from their young and chase cats off. So mm. it's more chasing the cats off, and if the cat tries to fight back, then the fox is gonna win. <laughs> um, 
So if you see some pictures of this, just fox it to me, and I'll take a look at it. <laughs> oh, can... brother. <laughs> you just had to you say had it. had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Dennis. All right, Bill. Um, I think this is a Lincoln viewer. Has a has a yard next to a creek. Continues to get weeds from the creek deeper and deeper. He's wondering if there is a fertilizer that he can use to combat the weeds and then to plant turf in the fall. It's hard to say what's in those weeds. I'm, I'm trying to imagine: is it a creek that's got you know trees and shrubs around it? Is it you know grass all the way down to the creek, and so we're getting um, weeds there? So I would. It's hard to really say what you should use from the fertilizer with a weed control product to combat a weed without knowing what the weed is. It's a paramount thing of IPM, IPM is to know what you're trying to control or prevent. So fertilizer in general is going to be good to help to uh, increase the density of that lawn. Um, so it's going to help to keep those weeds at bay. And then a lot of weeds can't handle mowing. And so if you're on a more frequent mowing program, uh, that will also help to, uh, to control kind of just weeds in general. So those are the two things that I would look at uh, first. And then if, if it's a, sp a specific weed moving its way up, we'd want to know what that is so we could uh, develop an appropriate action plan. Okay, so that might be an example of we need a picture. A or picture two. or a sample yeah. or something. Because yeah. right now that's just not enough to, to say this is what you should be using to, to control that. All right, excellent. Thanks, Bill. I don't know that we've ever gotten this kind of a rotten spot question, Kyle. Oh, Great. Perfect. <laughs> Congratulations. <Yeah. laughs> this, is, this is a viewer who's, who is allergic to leaf mold. Okay. And needs to weed the flowers, clean the gutters. Wonders whether with that allergy, better off working when the leaves are wet or dry. Will those spores be more of a problem one way or the other? Um, yeah, that's uh, kind of a toughie. Um, so one of the issues is when it's when it's wet, a lot of the fung a lot of the fungi will be more active, and so they'll be able to move a lot more. However, when it's dry, that's when a lot of them the the spores will be erupt will they'll erupt a lot more. So what I would recommend doing is <coughs> clean the gutters after we've ha we've had about two weeks of dry weather, and then we should be okay. But uh, yeah, so want to wait for it to be dry for a little while, and then we should be okay uh, picking, them up, picking them up. So those of us who want an inch of moisture a week on a Friday night so we can still garden and play golf are mm -hmm. not wanting to wait two weeks. Mm -hmm. Correct. <laughs> All right, Jeff, <clears throat> this is a Havelock viewer here in Lincoln. Um, has a 35-year-old maple, large leaves that turn dark burgundy, so I don't Sounds know, like Norway of some... Yeah. Um, has a big split on the south southwest side of the tree and is wondering anything to do is the tree doomed she will have the canopy cleaned up this fall but mm -hmm. kind of classic question for maples yeah you know it's it's really hard again kind of without a picture it's hard to tell what I would say is um, if the split if it appears that some bark, which we call callus, is starting to form to cover that split, that's a good sign that maybe we'll end up having something that will heal that. Um, and I wouldn't jump the gun and, and um, look at doing a removal right away. You know, it's something I would keep an eye on it. If, if the canopy is leafing out, if you don't see a lot of dead in the canopy, those are good signs. So I, I would wait right now on, on getting the chainsaw ready to go. Especially on a tree that old. Yeah, right. Yeah, six. Right. Good. While you are doing that, we will start the lightning round. Are you ready, I'm gentlemen? I'm ready. Okay. So this viewer wants to know if they dig their vegetable garden in the fall and turn it over, is it a waste of time and money to spread fertilizer at that time? Yes. Okay. Daffodils are all foliage. Is it time to divide them? Yeah, I think it would be, yeah, right. Okay. South Sioux City viewer uh, wonders, they covered their strawberries and a lot of their other perennial plants with a layer of straw. Is it time to go ahead and uncover those? Yes, it is time to uncover those. All right, we have a question about, can you use rain barrel water in the vegetable garden? I, you know, I guess um, I, I would probably say no. Okay, and? Can you dig, divide, and replant asparagus successfully? 
Yeah, I think you can. I, you know, at this time of year, um, I think as the Fed is already pushing, I would wait till maybe the fall to do something like that. All right. How do you kill volunteer trees in a shelter belt without killing everything else? And they're about a one to two inch caliper. Cuts them and right. still they come back. Uh, well, I guess you're going to have to stick with cutting them. You know, I worry about uh, some root grafting on some of the plants, and so that's why I would be hesitant to use any sort of herbicide treatment, any sort of stump killer on that. You may end up damaging the rest of the plants in your shelter belt. So it's just, just be persistent. All right. Nice job. Okay. You ready, Kyle? Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> you're always so happy for the lightning round. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite. <laughs> All right, uh, so Western Iowa is finding morel mushrooms. Is it our turn this weekend? Um, heard some reports that they're out. I have a buddy who went out today. I was hoping to bring one in to show and tell, but he didn't get back to me, unfortunately. So they're close. All right. Does fire blight spread between uh, apple trees without any human intervention? Uh, yes, yes it will. There are a lot of insects that can move, uh, move this, uh, the, the bacterial pathogen. All right. There is a white fungus on a, on a south-facing tree crack like the one we talked about, and it's swelled up in this rain. Does it I mean it's really active and a problem? Um, pass. <laughs> <laughs> do we treat sycamores for anthracnose now, or do we wait? Um, now it's probably a little bit too late to, um, to be treating them for anthracnose. You want to hit them right as the, right as the buds are starting to open. All right. Um, is needle cast favored by wet conditions or dry conditions? Depends on the needle cast. All right. Leaf spots on hydrangeas last year. Something to watch for this year. Um, yeah. Keep an eye out. If you see them, uh, prune them out and throw them away. All right. Excellent. Nice job. We're seeing our lightning. We're not hearing our thunder, are we? <laughs> it's that distant lightning. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Are you ready, Bill? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> 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 All right, three questions this week, one of them from Blair and one from West. When do we put down the pre-emerge? Pre-emergent, we're getting close. Uh, people are starting to apply it now, and I think that's it's pretty pretty good. Uh, we're starting to get into in the 50s, and with the warm weekend forecast, I think it's going to keep moving up. All right. Is it too late to top, top dress fescue with compost? This is a Nebraska City viewer. No, you can just always top dress with it. All right, and the next question is with how much compost, what depth? As much as you can <clears> apply <throat> without you know, completely suffocating the plant, and so getting it dried and fluffy so you can kind of get it in, let it settle, the grass regrow, then put a little bit more on. It's a great way to increase, improve the, uh, the health of your soil. All right, we have some bright yellow lawns yeah. with dandelions. What do we do now? Yeah, well, right when they're starting to go to seed, that's your second best time to control them, a product with 2,4-D. Uh, is going to be the, one of the better ones um, and then also generally fall control is going to be the best so just try to remember to make those fall applications because uh, they're going to be making seed now and it's going to get in, into other people's yards but uh, just try to to, uh, to wait until the fall and remember to do it then. Okay, we'll probably have some follow-up questions about dandelions. So that could have been to. like a three-minute answer <laughs> at least. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, are you ready Dennis? I'm always ready. <laughs> All right, so what is the water temperature that fish can tolerate before they croak? All the way down to right before freezing. There are some that can even go to just at freezing to be okay. As long as the water isn't hard, they can get oxygen out of it. All right, uh, what about fluctuating water temperatures for fish? If it's like all of a sudden they go into really cold it water? It depends on the species. Okay. Some can take it, some don't tolerate it. All right, what do moles eat? Earthworms, 90% of their diet. All right. Is there anything, and this comes from out in the central part of the state, that will actually deter prairie dogs from spreading it across property? Yeah, cornfields. They don't like cornfields because they can't hide <coughs> and it's tilled up and there's no food. So you put cornfields around them, they get into it and they go right back out. <laughs> okay. So cornfields. <laughs> All right. Um, does peppermint work to repel mice? No, <laughs> not in university studies. A lot of anecdotal there, but nothing. Nothing. All right, so we are out of lightning, but I have a couple of really good questions for you that we'll come up with. Okay. So, good? 
All right, excellent. Nice job, gentlemen. And yes, we'll come back to dandelions, Bill. Yeah, maybe lose. I'm a loser because of it. No, you're <laughs> not. <laughs> Jeff just had easy questions. Yeah, that's right. Finally. <laughs> All right, what are the plants of the week? They're looking a little peaked there. They're a little peaked, but we're, well, we got just a little bit left of the show, so they should, should be able to get through it. So we have the, the bluebells, which is obviously our blue flowering. So Virginia bluebells. Um, and you know, they're a nice shade, early shade perennial. Um, so they come up very quickly, they do their thing, and then they go dormant. But it's a fun plant to have this time of year. And then the, the one with the kind of the heart-shaped leaves here is red epimedium or barren wart. So it blooms first before the, the foliage emerges. So that's kind of, a, kind of a, an unusual sort of thing. And you can see even the foliage has a a red um, margin on it. So in it, as Kim says, it slowly, softly forms a, uh, a nice clump. And it comes in yellow, red, and white forms. So two pretty cool plants. So these are both kind of shade-loving plants, mm -hmm. right? Both so, shade-loving, yeah. So that's one of those we get a lot of questions. And so for mm -hmm. a shady area early in the spring, these would be two good choices. Mm -hmm. And if you want it to last over the summer, you don't plant the bluebells. Right, yeah. Because they're down right. they go. Perfect, all right, thank you, Jeff. All right, next set of pictures. Dennis, this one is for you, and this mm -hmm. is, by the way, a, uh, a Texas viewer who is now a Nebraska viewer, and Bill loved what we told them about the lawn. So establish the lawn, and then all of a sudden there is a big rabbit sitting in the lawn. Mm -hmm. Not unusual, but then came home from lunch and saw two spots of turf that were completely annihilated. Yeah, it shouldn't be too big. It's called a form. She's a gravid female. She's about ready to give birth. And what they do is they dig a hole down about four to six inches, pull all the fur off of her belly, line the hole, then labor the hole at night to feed the babies. So what she's doing, and usually if you go there before she has the babies, you, you just grub, you know, rake it out and put a little, you know, a cup full of soil in there, probably fill the hole. And just throw some seed on it, it'll come right back. Yeah, I mean, that, that looks to me it, like... It, it, it's very temporary. Yeah, that, that to me looks like it's a, it could be a bluegrass lawn based on some of the, maybe the, some of the rhizomes that were pulled up. So that's the case. You would just pack it back down, make it wet, uh, and then it will, it will fill back in. If it was a bigger hole and it was a tall fescue lawn, then you'd want to just sprinkle some seed in there and you could get any time of the year and, and uh, it will slowly fill back in. So not a big deal. All yeah. right, excellent. Thanks, guys. All right, Bill, your next one is also a wheat or a, a lawn, mm -hmm. another set of lawn pictures. Uh, two years ago, sprayed with Roundup to control, impacted the buffalo grass, and now has a fine stand of hen bit and other weeds. And one is the Speedwell, the, the yeah. little tiny blue one. Wants to reseed in late May or June, wants to know what to do to ensure a decent result. Yeah, this is a situation, it's easy to happen with <coughs> buffalo grass lawns. You think the grass is still dormant in, in uh, March or April, even April this year, and you see those weeds growing, so you think, oh, it's buffalo grass, I can round it up. Uh, but in actuality, even though it looks dormant, the, uh, the plant is starting to break dormancy and it's just not really elongating its leaves yet. And so a Roundup application here will, will cause problems. And that's what they saw with those, with those weeds there. So a lot of those weeds, like the henbit, are winter annuals. And so fortunately, a lot of them are gonna die off naturally. Um, you could go out now, though, if you're trying to, to get that buffalo grass in the ground. And we do find that the earlier you seed it, the better the results are gonna be. Um, so if you did want to clean it up with some kind of a selective herbicide, uh, it's a typical weed control product that will kill a lot of those off. And then I would seed that buffalo grass in. If you can cut it in with some type of a, um, tillage uh, through an aeration or an aerator or a um, power rake, get that into the ground and then use that, that starter fertilizer with that mesotrione in it because it, it doesn't hurt the buffalo grass, but it'll help prevent those, uh, those weeds that um, are going to germinate from germinating. And it, is, it, is, it can also selectively control weeds that you know get past that first application of a selective control. So that would be your way your way forward with that. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, this is a Syracuse viewer, Kyle, and has red twig dogwood. Okay. All of which looks like this. Uh, so she cut them off close to the ground. Okay. She wants to know what to do to stop this from reoccurring with the 
typical dogwood canker. Well, um, hopefully after she cut them last year, she removed all the all the tissue and practiced good sanitation, um, cleared up the, spit, the, around, the ground around it. Really sanitation would be the, the only thing that I would recommend. If it is bad enough, maybe you'd wanna look into, into getting one of those home fungicide products that could be sprayed on there. But really, I think pruning and sanitation should take care of it. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, Jeff, we have a viewer who sent us two different pictures of blue spruce, uh, both of which have grow outgrown themselves. So here's sure. the first one, right. and then the second one is a globe form. Uh, she's wondering how much she can prune them back and with what and when. Well, this is the time of year if you're gonna do some pruning. It's uh, early in the in this, well, late spring, early summer is uh, the best time. However, you know, there's not a lot you can remove off of either of these plants. So um, I would say that um, uh, if you, if they're too large for that particular location, you might want to consider something else at this stage. Uh, you know, they're healthy plants, but um, heavy, they won't tolerate heavy pruning, so. All right, yeah, and, and uh, a hedge trimmer is not the best no, idea. No, hedge trimmer, I mean, you, you could use a hand pruner on it, but again, you, right. there's just not a lot to remove, so. All right, thanks. Unfortunately, they put them in places where they get too big. Right. Yeah. Well, we have not visited our courtyard pond in a while, and as it turns out, it is really in need of a good scrubbing. Leaves, twigs, other plant materials, soil and algae and fish poop <laughs> can cause your pond to become a real mess and even build up enough to clog the pumps. So for our second feature tonight, we'll hear some good tips on keeping your pond clean and clear. So we're back out here in the Kime Hall Courtyard dealing with the pond that we have out here. Uh, we have some fun circumstances with us. We have a pond feature as well as behind me the pondless feature. Uh, so as with any pond, there no, there's no such thing as no or low maintenance. They take quite a bit of work to deal with in cleaning, regular maintenance annually or twice a year. Um, and then like in our case where we have some wildlife, some fish and turtles, maintenance kind of upsteps a little bit there as well. The problem that we're dealing with today is that in the lower section, the pondless feature started becoming a ponded feature. And the problem was that the rocks acted like a screen or a mesh and with blown in debris, leaf debris, soil residue from plants getting blown in, uh, algae growth that had come down the falls and into that pondless feature, started blocking up those rocks and they ad ended up acting like a screen and filled in. And then as we could tell over a couple weeks, the water level started getting higher and higher uh, and to the point that our liner that only went up so high, it ended, the water flew over the top and then started draining out our reservoir underneath of us. Um, ended up running the pump dry and luckily with newer pumps today, they have a fail safe that they'll shut off themselves. So it was safe, we saved the pump, but we still have to deal with the issue. Um, and the resolution for that that we're doing today is we're digging out this bottom basin um, to the point that we can tell that the rocks aren't plugged up anymore. Uh, you can tell leaf debris and just kind of a slime gets in between those rocks into those pore spaces and just builds up and then eventually plugs it up. Um, and with any screen or filter in any type of appliance or anything, it needs regular maintenance and cleaned out regularly. So today we're digging that out. We're gonna lay the rocks out over the pavement or the uh, sidewalk, take it with the hose and kind of wash them all off, clean them up. That way we'll get some nice color back to them. Um, we'll put it back into it, kind of reset the liners um, and then reset the rock walls and everything to how we like. Over time, those rocks do kind of gravity has an effect and they'll settle down. So we'll kind of pull everything back up, reset everything, and then get that pond back up and running. So as a homeowner with a pond or a pondless feature, what you're gonna be looking for is water level differences is the big key for any pump issues or any clogs or liner issues. Um, if you have big liner drops or water line drops, uh, you might have a leak somewhere. You might have like in our case where the rocks got plugged up and are running over the liner. Um, and then in case of like plant material in the pond, you might actually have a puncture in the liner. 
So with any pond, they're not low maintenance and there's no such thing as note maintenance. So you gotta be checking your pond regularly, doing scheduled clean outs and maintenance, checking your pumps, checking your falls, and of course cleaning out any pondless feature so that way you don't have any water loss issues. This is just one of those chores you'll have to do every so often to manage that buildup of trash and algae, and it does make a world of difference to the health of your plants and your aquatic creatures. It's also something you can pay somebody else to do. <laughs> all right, picture number four. So you did all that good teeth mark stuff, and here is a viewer who has a burning bush that has new gnaw marks on the base, and I think you can see it both on the base of that, and that's right. a nice euonymus. They think they have a woodchuck under the deck. And well, yeah, but I don't think it's a woodchuck. It's not a typical woodchuck. This is typical, the way I was looking at it, and I try to magnify it. it, I can't see the teeth marks, but I think it's a squirrel mark in this territory, because mm. it seems like there's several notches done at different times, and a male squirrel will go around, notch, rub his chin there, his squirrel graffiti, mm -hmm. telling the other squirrels, this is my turf, back off, mm -hmm. no offense. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it, it seems like tree squirrel, uh, territorial market. All right, excellent. All right, Bill. Um, you have yet another lawn question. Oh, it's lawn questions tonight. It is a lawn, yeah. Like I'm it. saving you from weeds. Yeah. So this, he used to be able to grow a bluegrass mix on the west and north side of the house and garage, died off several years ago, replanted, grows through one or two mowings, dies again. He's gone through this about five times. Various seed types, et cetera. So what's, yeah. what's the deal? You know, it's probably a shade issue. It could be a soil compaction issue too. That soil looks like it's really kind of matted down. Is there, is there traffic there? Um, I would stop with the bluegrass. I would stop with the shade mixes. Shade mixes have always fine fescues that really can handle traffic. <coughs> Tall fescue is the most tolerant uh, shade tolerant grass. Try to seed that there first or better off, try to sod it. Because if it's a shade issue, you can start with pristine sod and then it will slowly decay away. But if it's shade, it's eventually just a, a losing situation and maybe a mulch or ground cover or something like that would be a better alternative than, than the sod. But I think seeding in a shade situation is always a challenge and, and likely to fail. Right, and again, depending on the seed he's using. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot too. of seed too. You go to uh, certain stores and you look, it's a lot of annual ryegrass and things are just made to buy more seed next time. So making sure you're getting good seed and trying the tall fescue in a shade situation is going to be the best thing. All right, thanks, Bill. All right, Kyle, this is a viewer who uh, sent us pictures of this stuff. They think they know what it is, but they don't know what to do about it. It's in their plum. Okay, yeah, that looks like a black knot. Um, so it's a, a canker disease that affects a lot of different species of, of prunus trees. So uh, cherries, plums, um, some apples as well. Best uh, control for black knot is to, um, once, once the leaves have dropped, if you see any of, the, any of those um, kind of black cankers, just go and prune those branches out. When you're pruning them out though, you wanna make sure that you are pruning down at least four to five inches beneath the, where you see that black mass because that fungus will spread down a little bit beyond where that, where that mass is. Um, if, you're, if you do a lot of pruning and you still have issues with black knot, there are some fungicides that can be used. However, if you don't, do the, if you don't practice proper pruning and sanitation, you can spray all the fungicides in the world and the plums will still get black knot. All right, and those branches do not belong in the chipper, the compost No, they pile. don't. They should be yeah. either uh, burned or buried if you can. All right, thanks, Kyle. This is an eagle viewer. Okay. Jeff uh, has a weeping willow planted about two years ago. Is asking some good questions. Uh, it's southwest corner of the yard. He had the tree staked originally. Seems to be growing well. He wants to know about whether he should mulch it and whether he should do any pruning mm -hmm. on this tree. Well, uh, definitely. We have the lawn growing right up to the base of the tree. So, um, you know, a nice, oh, three to four feet out from the, from the tree, a nice ring around it. Uh, gently dig the sod out of there and, and replace that with a couple inches of mulch will help a lot and make your mowing easier and, and all that. So then you won't have to worry about the, the willow. It looks like it's developing kind of a nice leader uh, as it is right now. So I think that there's some of the lateral branching that you could bring back and head that back. 
to uh, to a, oh, a, a branch or, or a place where you have a couple other branches starting to form along there. So you could do some light pruning on that. But like I said, it looks like we have a good leader, so I'd leave that alone at this stage and just do some of the lateral branching pruning. All right, excellent. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> well, we have some nice announcements of fun things in the gardening world. And we're going to begin with one that is the perennial plant sale in Fremont on Saturday at the May Museum. Our second one is one that is the Sunset Hills Garden Club plant sale, um, Saturday, May 12th at 120th and William. And we have a uh, Gmail address on the screen for people if they have more questions about that one. And I think we have one more tonight, and that is the Garden Club of Lincoln plant sale, Monday, May 14th at Color Middle School, 52nd and Vine. So send us your announcements of cool things. If we get them in time, we'll put them on the air. All right, um, we have a Lincoln viewer, Dennis, who says, what could be damaging hostas this early? The ends of the leaves are being chewed off. If it's the ends being chewed off, it's either rabbits or deer. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure where they're at. But it's Lincoln. Lincoln, how close they are to the center. So deer right. all over, I mean, we have deer on East Campus. Right. Deer love the top of hostas, and so do rabbits. So if it's, if it's not being eaten between the veins like a, a slug or a snail, mm -hmm. if it's the tops eaten off and it's rabbits, most likely as it comes up. But mm -hmm. later on it'll be deer. All right. This is a Crete viewer, Bill. Uh, they have white clover. Okay. And they want to know whether tenacity is something that will control clover in a lawn. It does. I don't know. You might, you're going to need several applications with it. Um, I think other products like something with triclopyr in it um, is going to be a lot more successful than the tenacity, but I think there is some, some you will see the, the uh, leaves on the clover bleach out as it's starting to be starved for sugar. Um, and so you'll get some control, but uh, there's other products maybe a little bit better. Or just let it be. Or let it be if you want <laughs> And it. mow. And, and yeah. fertilize. <laughs> and let those bees come. Yeah, yeah. All right. So this is, let's see, new home. Kyle, and they f they're assuming they have brown patch through the lawn. Okay. This just came in, so I don't, they've tried every recommendation from a bunch of different sources to try to get this resolved, whatever this is. We don't know where they are. So what are we gonna recommend on this? For uh, brown patch, um, there are some fungicides that work, work fairly well for brown patch. As far as um, applic timing of those, yeah, right now we're not, it's, we don't have it. That's mm -mm. the problem. Yeah. That's going to be right. a hot uh, disease. And so right now that's probably more likely some kind of a, a winter issue or it's probably um, something like a nimble will or zoysia grass patch that's just slower to green up. Um, without a picture, it's hard to say, but I would not be treating for a brown patch right now. You don't have, there's really not any diseases out there right now across Nebraska. So in, this, in lawns. depending yeah. on where they are, a sample yeah, exactly. would be great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, good. This is a Beatrice question, uh, Jeff. Their asparagus, their patch is four years old, and all of a sudden all the, the, the stalks or the stems are pencil thin instead of nice edible things. Any mm. ideas on that one? Well, sometimes it may be pushing going to flower here a little early. So um, I think some of those, um, you know, I'd be patient. Weather may be uh, one of the factors here because it's been such a late spring. Um, but if it looks like it's bolting, I would go ahead and remove those stalks that, that start to bolt. But, you know, again, it's been so cool this spring, it's kind of hard to tell. All right, thanks, Jeff. We have a, about a minute or less. Okay. This is a carny viewer, Dennis. Um, voles eating the sweet potatoes, or they were last year. Yeah. How to get rid of them. Sweet potatoes? <laughs> Cook them up. I like them fried or mashed. No. Um, uh, <laughs> so the voles. Uh, the box traps, one brand is catch-alls. Nestle it down in there. Put a little bit of bird seed or grass seed around the entrance. Wind it up. It'll hold over 15 overnight. They'll follow each other. And then those traps are made to be put in a bucket of water to drown it. Uh, drown the little voles, or you can take the voles to your neighbors, whatever you want to do. <laughs> or not. Right, yeah. Or not. All right, Bill, 10 seconds. Dandelion, last thing to do for right now. Dandelions, we're going to wait a little bit until they start to uh, make that puff ball, and then that's our second best time to treat with some kind of 240 product. So wait a little bit and know those seeds are going to go everywhere, even if your neighbors got them. You probably already have them in your soil.